Hello and welcome to Psych Guys, where we talk about the psychology of the era, the science of games. I am your host, Dr. Rachel Cowart, and on today's episode of Research Review, we're going to take a look at a 2020 paper entitled Real World Social Support, but not in-game social support, is related to reduced depression and anxiety associated with problematic gaming by Pham, Ellathorpe, and Meshi, published in Addictive Behaviors. This article opens by discussing the links between problematic play and negative mental health outcomes, such as increased depression and anxiety. They note that social support provides a buffer for mental health challenges such as these, and hypothesize that in-game social support could provide the same buffering effects as traditional out-of-game forms of social support, specifically focusing on the relationships with depression and anxiety. Social support is believed to be helpful due to a combination of concrete instrumental aid, emotional support, and self-esteem enhancement. Instrumental aid is the ability to provide tangible favors like help you move or lend you money. Emotional support is being there when you're upset, when you need someone to talk to, when you need a shoulder to cry on. And self-esteem enhancement, well, friends build us up. The researchers hypothesized that in-game social support, while perceived to be effective by gamers and other research, may not be as effective at providing concrete aid and emotional support than more traditional relationships, therefore reducing its ability to buffer against things like depression and anxiety. To assess these relationships, they conducted a survey of 361 university students, some of which belonged to an esports group. They measured problematic gaming, depression, anxiety, in-game and out-of-game social support, which they refer to as the virtual world and real-world social support, which will put me on my soapbox, but I'm gonna let it go because a lot of people use that terminology. Their analyses found that problematic gaming was significantly associated with decreased real-world social support and increased in-game social support, but only real-world, or out-of-game, social support was associated with reduced depression and anxiety. In-game social support showed no significant relationships. Furthermore, problematic gaming had a significant direct effect on depression and anxiety. That is, problematic gaming was associated with increased depression and increased anxiety. The authors conclude that real-world social support should be encouraged in the face of problematic gaming behaviors. After I read this article, I have to admit, I have a few lingering questions and a few criticisms about the breadth of their conclusions and the methods. So let's take a deeper look. First of all, what about non-problematic gaming? To me, that's a more interesting question because problematic gaming is a vague concept with a lot of nuances and gaming in and of itself is ubiquitous. The researchers seemingly focused on problematic gaming because of its relationships with depression and anxiety. But if the research question is, quote, do in-game friendships and specifically gaming friendships as compared to other online friendships provide the same buffer for mental health challenges as real world or out of game friendships, then the focus on problematic gaming seems not really relevant. The researchers themselves even note, quote, there has been little research on the downstream consequences of in-game social support, especially with regard to mental health outcomes such as depression and anxiety. It could be that gamers receive in-game social support, but does this have the same beneficial effects on mental health as real world social support? So measure that. That's not what was measured here. The second issue comes with the sample. Why differentiate between general university population and esports players, people who are part of an esports group on campus? In my opinion, they should have focused on one group or the other, not intermingled them, or provide separate analyses on each of these subpopulations and compare them. Although when you look deeper, the esports sample was only 41 participants, so to be honest, they probably should have just excluded them. I mentioned there are problems with problematic gaming. If you've seen my rants before, you know how I feel about gaming addiction and the way that the concepts have been generated. There's a letter signed by a whole bunch of scholars, I'll link it below, uh, that you can read that talks about the problems with the conceptualization of problematic gaming um, and addicted gaming. But I digress. Part of the problem with problematic gaming measures is that it doesn't really tease out problematic from highly engaged. Arguably, the esports team would be more highly engaged than the general university population. The specific problematic gaming measure used in this study mm, leaves little to be desired. One of the questions in their measure was, quote, I spend more time playing video games than initially intended. Surely a member of an esports team is very likely to say yes to this question. Maybe they are practicing longer than they intended. Maybe a tournament went longer than they intended. It's hard to say if that's problematic or not. 
They adjusted their problematic gaming scale from a problematic series watching scale, so from a binge watching scale, which seems odd in 2020 because there are plenty of problematic gaming scales that have been developed. There are systematic differences between actively consuming video games and passively consuming television, so I'm not really sure why they used this scale in the first place. Anxiety was measured with an eight point short item scale, which I'm not familiar with the scale, but an example question that they give is quote, how often have you felt the following in the last seven days? Which makes me think the focus is on state or environmental versus trait or personality based anxiety. There's a significant difference between these two concepts. And I wonder why they chose to use one that measured state or more transient anxiety than the more long-term personality-based trait anxiety. It's been my general understanding that the links between problematic gaming and anxiety are more related to trait anxiety than state anxiety. So I would just like a more elaboration here on why they chose to use this assessment and what it's really measuring. So the takeaway here, it's an okay study. I mean, the analyses are solid. They did find significant relationships, but I'm not really sure how enlightening or novel this finding is considering the muddled sample, the focus on problematic gaming and the focus on state anxiety. I would love to see a follow up without the focus on problematic gaming. Can in game social support provide a buffer for depression and anxiety in ways that we know traditional relationships can? This is a more interesting question and one I'd like to see in the numbers. Because anecdotally, we already know that gamers say they perceive online friendships as important or more important than in-game friendships. And we also know that in-game friendships can and do provide various kinds of social and emotional support. So does this transition into tangible benefits when it comes to depression and anxiety? We're going to need another study to figure that out. If you like this video and want to see more, please like and subscribe. And until next time, be excellent to each other and always cite your sources.